voilà, donc euh, la première table ronde, euh, les, les arbres et la forêt, <coughs> des multiples services pour être mis en valeur de façon globale. Excusez-moi, j'ai traduit de la version anglaise. Et, donc j'invite à, à venir euh, ici euh, à Giuseppe Scarazia Mugnosa. Et Jean Ravel, et Julio Pedro Toribio et Eduardo Esposito, qui, qui feront partie de la première, de la première table. Je ne sais pas. Can I use this one? Yes. Okay. Good morning. Thank you, Julio. And good morning to, to everybody. Thanks to uh, the organizer, to GID, to the president of GID, the secretary general of CIAM and to the director of the of this beautiful institute now i i was asked to uh, je m'excuse je je vais parler en, en anglais et parce que les, les, la présentation c'est c'est un dans cette langue um, i was asked to to present some information about the contribution of wooded land for climate regulation um, uh, I'm Giuseppe Scarascia from the University of Tuscia, but at the same time also from the European Forest Institute. We just opened a facility, a new facility in Rome on BioCities. And I'm also a member, uh, j'ai l'honneur d'être membre de la de l'Académie d'Agriculture de France. Um, uh, okay, I can start immediately giving uh, my... Uh, let's say my um, my view on the uh, climate regulation that are at least uh, uh, occurs via three different processes. Um, the first one, um, I, I I reported uh, in order to to I mean to provide information about these uh, uh, ways of regulation of climate change. I uh, I. Uh, based myself on, on this nice paper and picture by Bonan in science, appearing in science in 2008, uh, showing the complex relationship between, uh, among trees, uh, forest ecosystems, and uh, uh, hydrological cycle and carbon cycles that are really strictly uh, coupled. Now, the first uh, way that trees and uh, forests can uh, uh, regulate, influence uh, the uh, climate is uh, actually a indirect way through mitigation and through removal of CO2 and greenhouse gases. But about this, uh, yes, already Ricardo Valentini talked uh, quite a lot. So I, I will uh, go very quickly through this point. The second, um, the second process is, uh, in my opinion, a direct one in which trees and forest ecosystem can influence uh, climate through the relationship with the energy butter energy budget with the land energy budget so reflection and absorption of uh, uh, radiation and also through water through uh, ev evapotranspiration in this way uh, forests and trees can uh, cool down the uh, climate then a third way uh, in my opinion, that is also interesting, involves uh, actually at local scale, uh, urban areas, cities. And so, uh, again, in this way, there is a, a control of climate bar, uh, but I would say more on a uh, local scale. So at uh, the level of urban microclimate, but it is interesting too, and we will spend uh, some, um, I mean, one or two pictures on on these. And finally, also, as you can see, there is uh, uh, all the uh, interaction with uh, management and with the cycle of the of the forest that uh, is quite uh, uh, important. Now, let's go quickly to the first uh, process. So carbon uh, absorption, very quickly, on the left hand, uh, there are the emission by deforestation, but mainly by industries and particularly by uh, building construction and management. Um, and uh, at a smaller extent also uh, through uh, agriculture and of course, transportation. On the other, on the, on the right hand side, we see the, uh, on the other way, the absorption of these uh, 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 excess of uh, emissions, uh, almost, uh, I mean, more than 40%. Yeah. 
is uh, uh, in the atmosphere. And uh, leave? No. What should I do? Got it? Okay. So uh, the, um, the biogenic uh, sink sinks are mainly terrestrial ecosystem, particularly forest and the ocean. But what I want to underline is that forests are the most important biogenic sink, even more than, uh, than ocean. And here the information on the role of Mediterranean forest, but already you know this type of information. What I would like to uh, underline now is how management of forest ecosystem could be important also to, uh, let's say, to um, uh, for carbon removal and so indirectly for climate change uh, uh, regulation, climate regulation, climate change mitigation. Um, of course, uh, to take into consideration um, forest management on uh, carbon in general sequestration and particularly um, taking into consideration also the uh, harvested carbon woody stocks. Of course, uh, we need also uh, modeling in order to make, uh, um, let's say, scenarios and uh, uh, forecast over uh, quite long rotation. And here I would like just to report some information on some modeling exercise, but I have also to tell you that now there are a lot of interest and a lot of activities on, on, on this. So including forest management for, um, I mean, to, to, uh, to forecast and to anticipate and to estimate uh, carbon uh, um, sequestration, carbon removal. And this is uh, one um, piece of work that was done on Mediterranean forest, particularly on uh, Pinus Laricio. Uh, so on uh, um, forests of Pinot Rio, just in the middle of the Mediterranean, in the region Calabria of, uh, of Italy. So we started from um, um, real forest stand uh, with, as you can see, with different type of uh, forest management, uh, thinning that were uh, applied to this uh, forest, uh, um, um, I mean, reforested forest stand, and also uh, on different type of uh, silvicultural treatment, so shelter wood compared to uh, small clear cuts and so on. Uh, very quickly, uh, what did we found with this uh, uh, forest modeling over a period of 100 to up to 200 years? Um, on uh, your left, there are uh, the effect. Um, um, each each line is a is a is a zero line. So uh, the points, uh, the color points on your left are a, a decrease in carbon removal. On the right, there are increase of carbon removal. Uh, the main point is about uh, the increasing of um, carbon uh, stock, uh, uh, including both the sequestration into the forest ecosystem, but also into the uh, carbon woody stocks and timber, considering uh, timber as utilized for structural timbers over a period of time of at least 100 years or more. And this is quite uh, reasonable as an assumption. And in this way, we can see that applying different type of uh, management, uh, like, as I said, uh, thinning or different silvicultural treatments, in any case, the uh, effect, the overall uh, effect on, um, I mean, on carbon stocks, including the harvested wood, is quite evident, with an increase of about 40 to 50 percent, even though we applied different climate change scenarios with increase of temperature and decrease of rain. So, in, uh, uh, in few words, uh, uh, the overall effect on carbon fluxes, so uh, net uh, uh, primary productivity or gross primary productivity, were more or less uh, uh, stable, zero, or they were becoming more negative over time. But including forest management and uh, uh, utilization of, of, uh, uh, of timber and other type of, let's say, of harvested wood, uh, uh, the uh, response, the effects is 
quite clear that uh, there is uh, an increase of the overall carbon uh, sequestration. Uh, we will comment later on on uh, this type of information, but I wanted to show, I think that this is, of course, modeling exercise, but uh, this type of information is being confirmed by many different type of uh, modeling scenarios, also in other areas and regions of Europe and other species, like for instance, beech or spruce. Now let's go on uh, to the second, uh, let's say, process for um, climate regulation. And this is the more direct one. Uh, I, I would like, first of all, to start mentioning that uh, uh, a famous uh, uh, climatologist from Spain, Milan Milan, already several years ago, more than 20 years ago, has shown working on, uh, um, on different uh, regions and also uh, peri-urban areas of the Mediterranean, mainly Western Mediterranean in Spain, but also in Italy, uh, 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 identify that land use perturbation accumulated over historical time in the Mediterranean uh, could have induced changes in surface temperature, air mass temperature, and, uh, and moisture. And in effect, uh, uh, more recently, uh, we, uh, I mean, there have been a, quite a series of papers that uh, appear on, on uh, uh, let's say, on the uh, scientific literature showing that actually, really, we can detect uh, uh, this type of effect. For instance, in, uh, in China, uh, working on uh, uh, this blue are uh, natural forest uh, or uh, planted forest uh, um, using um, satellite maps of, uh, let's say, uh, surface temperature, they detected that, for instance, where there are forest areas, blue or uh, dark blue forest and planted forest, the uh, temperature is in general, uh, particularly during the day, is uh, decreasing by uh, 1 to, uh, one to 1 1.5 degrees compared to uh, crop areas or to grassland. So uh, shifting from shifting from uh, cropland and grassland to forest and reforestation, there is a general effect of a decrease of about minus uh, degree. Uh, same type of information was found also at at the global scale by, for instance, uh, Alcama Cescati, Duvillier and Cescati and other people working mainly at the Joint Research Center in Ispra. And they found that uh, overall, there is a, a clear effect uh, on the average of about uh, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 degrees or an effect of 20%, 18% of the CO2 em emission signal in all these uh, regions of the world. So red means that, on the contrary, if you uh, deforest, so if you lose forest, there is uh, an increase of temperature, particularly in arid and semi-arid zones, and so including also the Mediterranean. So it seems that uh, actually there is this uh, effect of reforestation on reducing temperature or deforestation increasing temperature and other uh, parameters of climate. I would like to uh, close uh, just uh, mentioning uh, uh, a third aspect of climate regulation that, as I said, could be considered as a local um, uh, regulation uh, process of the urban microclimate. Why urban areas? I think that we foresters should take more into consideration also the role of trees and green infrastructure in cities and in uh, peri-urban areas. Why this? 60%, uh, 55% of the population of the global population lives in cities and cities cover only two, three, up to 8% in Europe of the of the global land, but they emit more than 70%. So they, they basically produce more than 70% of all the emissions. So one of the main causes, or actually the main causes of climate change reside in the cities, in the urban areas, and in the peri-urban areas. And this is where 
most of the people lives. So I think that as foresters, we should also take into account the importance of these uh, uh, areas uh, where nature-based solution, trees, forests, urban forests can really uh, play a, an important role. For instance, here we can see the effect of temperature on surface temperature of trees, of shade of trees, but also of the uh, evapotranspiration. We have to take into consideration the role for removing uh, pollutants, but also uh, the role, the interaction with uh, with uh, health of the population, thermal comfort, respiratory diseases, and so on. And then one more important point is also that biodiversity uh, plays a key role also from a uh, climate regulation point of view, because uh, going from a less biodiverse to a more biodiverse uh, urban forest, there is uh, an increasing effect on cooling. And so I'm just uh, closing with few, uh, let's say, uh, comments, or if you want recommendation. Forests of the, of the Mediterranean globally exert a considerable effect on climate regulation directly and uh, indirectly. Both mitigation and adaptation are fundamental to tackle uh, climate change, but at the same time also for conservation and resilience. Water reliability, of course, is uh, plays a key role in all these uh, interactions. And uh, I would like just to underline the role of silvicultural strategies. So management already yesterday was shown as an important factor. And I would like just to add a piece of information that actually it seems also that it has a role of increasing the overall uh, carbon stock and carbon removal by forest uh, ecosystem. This is uh, mainly from, uh, as I said, uh, modeling exercise, but we need probably a network or a, a, an international or a, at least a, a European network on long-term silvicultural experiments for our different uh, forest ecosystem. Need to involve citizens. If we have the involvement of cities, for, for, of citizen, for instance, showing them the importance of green infrastructure for health and well-being, probably they will also become more aware about climate change and uh, also ecosystem management. And presently, the general mentality is a urban mentality and not a rural one. So we have to work, we have to convince uh, citizens on the importance of trees, forest ecosystem, and also about their management. And finally, the importance of trans transdisciplinary research. For instance, I think that it is very important for us to collaborate not only with, for instance, uh, information technology, remote sensing specialists, but also with architects, urban planners, because the forester, I mean, have not such a loud voice as the architect or urban planners have. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Giuseppe. Um, now, maintenant, on va donner la place à Monsieur Jean Alvergel. Ok, bonjour. Merci de me donner la parole. Je voudrais d'abord euh, remercier les organisateurs euh, pour l'invitation et pour euh, la demande qu'ils m'ont faite. Je crois que c'était sur le seul sujet sur lequel je pouvais parler dans cette euh, dans cette conférence. Et puis, tout le plaisir aussi que j'ai à me retrouver avec vous ici à Chania. Donc, euh, comprendre l'impact des arbres et des forêts méditerranéennes sur la régulation hydrique et la conservation des sols. Je vais, faire, je vais vous faire un petit speech en trois points que j'ai indiqué ici. Donc, le premier point, alors oui, pour me présenter, donc, je suis Jean Albergel, je suis directeur de recherche émérite de l'IRD à l'UMR Lisa. Je suis de la section 5 de l'Académie d'agriculture et je suis aussi membre honoraire de l'Académie africaine des sciences. Au, voilà. Alors, mon, mon premier point, la régulation hydrique. Euh, des arbres. Alors, les arbres et les forêts méditerranéennes jouent un rôle essentiel dans la régulation hydrique et la lutte contre l'érosion par leur système racinaire et par leur canopée. Leurs racines aident à retenir l'eau dans le sol, réduisant ainsi l'érosion et le ruissellement. En Espagne, les forêts de pins méditerranéens ont des systèmes racinaires profonds qui contribuent à l'infiltration et à la rétention de l'eau dans le sol. Cela aide à maintenir un débit constant dans les rivières et les ruisseaux pendant les périodes de sécheresse. Cependant, un excès de reboisement 
ou trop d'arbres peut réduire le ruissellement, augmenter le retour de l'eau vers l'atmosphère par évapotranspiration et potentiellement priver les stocks d'eau des petits barrages et des réservoirs. Cela peut se produire lorsque la densité de plantation des arbres est trop élevée, créant une concurrence excessive pour l'eau, ou lorsque les espèces d'arbres à forte évapotranspiration sont plantées en grande quantité. En Espagne, les forêts de pins ont été reboisées massivement dans cette région, en particulier dans les Pyrénées, pour lutter contre l'érosion et les désertifications. Cependant, les pins ont des, racines, des systèmes racinaires profonds et une forte évapotranspiration. Cela a entraîné une réduction du ruissellement de l'eau disponible pour les réservoirs et les barrages locaux, ce qui a eu des conséquences sur l'approvisionnement en eau. En Tunisie, des plantations d'acacias ont été utilisées pour restaurer des zones dégradées par l'érosion. Les acacias sont connus pour leur capacité à améliorer les sols, mais ils ont également une forte évapotranspiration. Et dans certaines régions tunisiennes, cela a conduit à une réduction du ruissellement de l'eau disponible pour les petits barrages et les réservoirs, ce qui a eu un impact sur l'approvisionnement en eau agricole. Il est important donc de noter que la planification et la gestion des reboisements sont essentiels pour minimiser les impacts négatifs, le choix des espèces, la densité des plantations, la gestion de l'eau et la surveillance des impacts environnementaux sont des considérations clés pour assurer que les reboisements ne privent pas la ressource, les ressources locales en eau. L'autre partie, c'est la canopée des arbres. Alors, la canopée des arbres contribue à l'interception des précipitations, ce qui permet de réduire l'impact direct des pluies sur le sol et de favoriser l'infiltration de l'eau dans le sol. La canopée dense des forêts de chênes liège en Corse réduit l'impact des pluies torrentielles en ralentissant la vitesse des gouttes de, de pluie avant qu'elles n'atteignent le sol, favorisant ainsi l'infiltration de l'eau. Mon deuxième point, c'est l'arbre et les forêts dans la conservation des sols. Les sols méditerranéens sont considérés comme fragiles à l'érosion et cela est dû à plusieurs facteurs environnementaux et géologiques spécifiques à la région méditerranéenne. La région méditerranéenne est caractérisée par un climat sec et des étés chauds avec des précipitations souvent concentrées en automne et au printemps et intenses. Ces pluies torrentielles occasionnelles suivies de longues périodes de sécheresse peuvent entraîner un ruissellement intense augmentant les risques d'érosion. De nombreux sols méditerranéens sont rocheux et peu profonds, ce qui signifie qu'ils ont une capacité limitée à retenir l'eau et à résister à l'érosion. Certaines zones méditerranéennes présentent des pentes raides, on le voit ici quand on regarde par la fenêtre, ce qui rend les sols particulièrement sensibles à l'érosion. Les sols sont plutôt pauvres en matière organique et donc ont une faible capacité à retenir l'eau. Certaines pratiques agricoles traditionnelles, comme le défrichage, la surexploitation des terres et le surpâturage, ont contribué à la dégradation des sols méditerranéens et à leur vulnérabilité à l'érosion. Les incendies de forêt, qui sont fréquents dans les régions méditerranéennes en raison des conditions climatiques chaudes et sèches, peuvent éliminer la végétation protectrice et exacerber le risque d'érosion sur les terres brûlées. Les feux de forêt de grande ampleur, qui sont de, qui sont de plus en plus récurrents depuis 2017 dans toute cette région, comme les grands incendies du Portugal, en Corse, en Algérie, en Grèce ou en Turquie cette année, ont détruit des milliers d'hectares de forêt. Ces incendies ont entraîné une perte de biodiversité, une augmentation du risque d'érosion sur les terres brûlées et une détérioration de la qualité de l'air. Les systèmes racinaires denses des arbres et des plantes forestières aident à stabiliser les sols et à prévenir leur érosion par le vent et l'eau. Les racines étendues des oliviers et des chênes verts en Grèce contribuent à stabiliser les sols et à les protéger contre l'érosion, notamment sur les pentes les plus abruptes. La litière forestière, composée de feuilles, de branches et d'autres débris végétaux, agit comme une couverture protectrice sur le sol, réduisant son exposition aux éléments et limitant ainsi l'érosion. Les forêts méditerranéennes contribuent à améliorer la qualité des sols en fournissant des matières organiques et des nutriments grâce à leur décomposition. Euh, voilà, je passe à mon troisième point. Donc, le re, les reboisements et l'agroforesterie peuvent-ils remplacer la forêt naturelle dans la régulation de la de hydrique il n'existe pas de réponse unique quant à savoir si les reboisements sont aussi efficaces que la végétation naturelle pour réguler les flux hydriques et résister à l'érosion. La végétation naturelle a généralement évolué pour s'adapter aux conditions locales, mais des reboisements bien planifiés et entretenus peuvent également jouer un rôle important. Les reboisements jouent un rôle essentiel dans la lutte contre l'érosion après un incendie de forêt. Cependant, leur efficacité dépend de plusieurs facteurs, notamment le choix des espèces, la densité de plantation et la gestion. Après un incendie de forêt en Italie, 
Les reboisements ont été réalisés en utilisant des espèces d'arbres indigènes telles que le chêne liège. Ces reboisements ont contribué à restaurer la végétation, à stabiliser les sols et à réduire le risque d'érosion. En Grèce, des programmes de reboisement ont été mis en place après des incendies pour planter des pins maritimes qui ont des systèmes racinaires robustes pour protéger les sols contre l'érosion. Dans la région méditerranéenne, des reboisements mixtes avec différentes espèces d'arbres, par exemple des chênes et des pins, peuvent créer une couverture végétale plus dense et diversifiée, ce qui renforce la stabilité du sol. En Turquie, la plantation de plantes couvre-sol, comme le romarin entre les arbres reboisés, favorise une couverture végétale continue qui réduit l'impact des gouttes de pluie sur le sol et réduit le ruissellement et l'érosion. La pression sur les terres arables étant forte dans tout le bassin méditerranéen, les communautés rurales ont depuis longtemps cherché à associer l'arbre à l'agriculture. Elles... L'agroforesterie peut aider à réduire l'érosion des sols en utilisant les arbres pour créer des barrières naturelles contre le vent et l'eau. Par exemple, des rangées d'arbres ou d'arbustes plantés au contour le long des pentes peuvent ralentir le ruissellement et réduire l'érosion. Des systèmes agroforestiers méditerranéens traditionnels sont diversifiés et sont adaptés aux conditions spécifiques. On peut parler de la DSA, qui est un système agroforestier traditionnel, où des chênes comme le chêne liège et le chêne vert coexistent avec les pâturages du bétail. Les arbres fournissent de l'ombre pour le bétail et produisent également du liège et des glands. Ce système est, Ce système est courant en Espagne et au Portugal. Les oliveraies en Grèce sont souvent associées à des arbres fruitiers tels que des figuiers et des amandiers. Les arbres offrent de l'ombre aux oliviers et aux cultures sous-jacentes. Le système sylvo-agroforestier de l'Arganier au Maroc, que l'on voit sur cette photo, est un exemple remarquable de pratiques traditionnelles qui associent la culture de l'Arganier à des activités agricoles et d'élevage dans les régions semi-arides du Maroc, en particulier dans le sud-ouest du pays. L'Arganier est un arbre endémique des régions semi-arides du Maroc, en particulier dans, les, dans le sud-ouest du pays. Les éleveurs de chèvres utilisent souvent les, les zones autour des arganiers pour le pâturage de leurs troupeaux. Les chèvres se nourrissent des feuilles et des fruits de l'arganier, ce qui contribue à la dispersion des graines et à la régénération naturelle de l'arbre. Euh, plus, plusieurs exemples, on pourrait parler aussi des systèmes agroforestiers en, en, dans les vignobles de Toscane, les systèmes au Libanais où on trouve des systèmes agroforestiers traditionnels avec des arbres fruitiers comme les agrumes qui sont associés à des caroubiers. Mais en conclusion, puisque je suis pris un peu par le temps, les arbres et les, et les forêts méditerranéennes jouent un rôle vital dans la régulation hydrique et la conservation des sols, tout en contribuant à la biodiversité et à la qualité de vie des populations locales. La préservation et la gestion responsable des écosystèmes sont essentielles pour faire face aux défis environnementaux et assurer la durabilité de la région méditerranéenne. L'agroforesterie offre de nombreux avantages en matière de régulation hydrique et de conservation des sols en région méditerranéenne en créant des systèmes agricoles plus durables, résilients et bénéfiques pour l'environnement. Et je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup. Si les gens, euh, je m'excuse pour la présentation. Euh, J'avais préparé une petite euh, introduction pour chaque participant. Et, mais voilà, avec les, on, comme on était pressé, j'ai raté ça. Donc, si vous me permettez, je vais faire l'introduction pour les, les prochains euh, intervenants. Et, bon, notre prochain euh, intervenant, c'est Julio Pedro Satorivio euh, de l'Organisation mondiale de la santé. Et il est médecin péruvien avec un, un degré postgraduate en Angleterre et aux États-Unis en gestion des politiques de santé et financement de la santé internationale. Et 28 ans d'expérience en santé publique et dans la coopération internationale. Et voilà, il a couvert plusieurs postes à l'OMS et à la coopération belge. Et aujourd'hui, il est conseiller en système et services de santé dans les bureaux du pays de, de Brésil. Donc euh, voilà, euh, bienvenue, Julio. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Um, bonjour. Je viens de la, du Brésil, 
je veux parler Esperanto 3.0, qui est une langue qui mélange un peu euh, français, anglais, espagnol et portugais. Euh, je suis très heureux de participer dans cette réunion, euh, parce que je comprends bien que la santé non est mais un... Um, like uh, my um, colleague, uh, ancient colleague of uh, WHO, Julio Ruela, told me, uh, I will change to English, um, and I will talk about the uh, impacts uh, in, in health uh, of um, uh, ecosystem Forest here. First of all, I would like to present which are the the, the risk factors uh, associated with the, which is uh, the group of major illnesses around the world, not only in uh, in the in Europe, but in all the countries. It's now non-communicable disease, um, especially. Uh, in urban settings. Uh, in, diseases uh, increasing a lot in the last 20, 30 years are cardiovascular diseases, cancers, chronic respiratory diseases, diabetes, and mental health. And uh, exposures, exposure to forests can provide us benefits, which includes uh, the ability of our immune system to protect us, to defend us, and also to improve blood pressure, hair rate, blood glucose, and stress hormones, which are at the basis of the burden of uh, mental health uh, in, in the world. Access to forests contributes as well to increase physical activity, which is uh, associated with obesity and uh, reduced stress levels. Furthermore, forest clean water and air um, reduce the risk to infectious diseases by filtering pollutants, uh, which uh, has an important role in reducing non-communicable diseases. Forests also help mitigate the health impact of water pollution, filtering pollutant from water, reducing pollutant inputs, especially for instance, uh, to reduce diarrheal diseases, which is one of the leading cause of mortality still in some major part of the world. Three group of um, forest positively impact are on, the, on nutrition and food security. Uh, through soil and habitat conservation, as well, uh, we, um, the forest, uh, contributes to sustainable agriculture, which is necessary for increasing food security. For communities like in Brazil, in the Amazon Basin, which I am working on, the really, which really is still on forest for food, uh, this can be a critical safety net by supplying micronutrients and protein from wild sources. Finally, forests can protect people as well from the harsh impacts of natural hazards, flooding, landslide, landslide avalanche, wildfire, and storm, and other that it is being exacerbated by current climate change. Rural forest also has a preventive role in, 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 in vulnerable places, uh, especially in urban settings. For instance, extreme heat, physical risk from accelerated stormy acti storm activity and other events which are connected to climate change. For emergency, uh, increasing also a spreading of zoonotic infectious disease that we all know uh, 
recently Zika, Dengue, and other diseases, uh, forests are the first line of defense. Deforestation for, uh, uh, protects or threatens this protective role is, uh, against infectious disease. And that's why can increase, deforestation can increase disease risk for human by improving and altering the biology of disease vectors habitats. Uh, this is uh, especially because of decrease the biodiversity, which is something that dilute disease vector infection rates. This is a, just a, a graphic of how many uh, impacts are relying uh, on forests uh, and uh, are forest dependent. 60% of existing human infectious diseases are zoonotic, is uh, related to also to animal diseases. At least 75% of emerging infectious in the recent years are related to um, zoonotic issues like Ebola, even HIV and others. Five new human diseases appear every year. Three of them, more than a half, are half animal origin. 80% of agents with potential uh, rise is, are related as well. Some numbers, some facts. Over 56,000 people die each year because of heat in the Americas. Over 3 million cases of dengue, which has a 1% or 2% of lethality uh, occurs in America. In 2019 was the highest, the peak of number uh, in, the, in the history. And the health sector is responsible for 3 and 10% of national greenhouse gas as well. Children born in Americas in 22,000 will experience or has experienced uh, more will fire, more river floods, more droughts. Currently, Amazon area is suffering the highest drought in the last 30 years. Crop fire, heat waves, and we were been working as well in the in the Caribbean area, which uh, hurricanes of category four and five increases by more than 10%. Burden of diseases, you can see in many Latin American countries, also in between eight and 20% of the deaths are related to um, climate and uh, environment. And also uh, DALIS, which is a relation and in between uh, deaths and disabilities causes by these uh, diseases. 250 deaths every year will be related to climate change between 2030 to 2050. Finally, but uh, for me, one of the key messages that I wanted to share with you is One Health. One Health is a proposal uh, developed by UN uh, agencies, recognizing especially of linkage of human life, human livestock, companion animal and wildlife health. We see one health as a way, as a mean to adding values for closer cooperation of human and animal health, providing more knowledge, better health and economic benefits as well. One Health is the collaborative eff effort of multiple uh, disciplines working locally, national, and globally to attain optimal health for people, animal, and our environment. As you can see FAO, WHO, UNICEF, World Bank, and other UN organizations are engaged in One Health. 
just to close, make some reference to the place that we are working on. Hippocrates, father of modern medicine, already see this relationship. And, and we have inspiration from the Greek father of medicine, which based also his approach, recognizing that human health, animal health, and environmental health are part of a whole body, whole universe. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Um, thank you very much, uh, Julio. Um, now uh, I'm going to call um, uh, the last uh, presenter of this table, uh, Eduardo Esposito. Uh, Eduardo holds a BAC on forest science from the University of Tusia in Italy and a Master of Science on Forestry and Natural Conservation from Wageningen University and research in the Net Netherlands. Um, during his M uh, master's thesis um, and as internship on, on uh, he um, internship on his thesis, he he was at the Instituto Superior of uh, Agronomia de Lisboa. Lisboa. He specialized on Mediterranean forest ecology and resilience. Um, now he's working at the Instituto Oikos uh, on on a for, on a project uh, uh, called Mediter Air. Three and so he will be explaining to us a little bit the the outcomes of this project uh, to promote uh, fire smart landscapes in the Mediterranean region. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for the introduction, Julio. And thanks. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizer to have given me this opportunity to present today. So. Um, yeah, so as uh, Julio already said, I'm here to present um, the results of one of the working packages of the project that I am coordinating. Um, the name of the project is Restoring the Resilience of Mediterranean Landscape to Reduce Greenhouse Gas Emissions from Wildfires. Uh, the shorter name is Mediter 3. And um, the project uh, lasts for two years. Uh, it will be finished in uh, December of this year. It, in, it is structured in uh, four work packages and um, it involved one applicant, Instituto Oikos, and other four partners. And one of these is actually the mic from, from the, uh, the mic from Hania. And the project aimed to reduce uh, basically fire-related greenhouse gas emissions in three target landscapes in Greece, Montenegro, and France through the application of fire smart landscape principles. So here an overview of the three target landscapes. Um, we have one in southern France in the Luberon Regional Natural Park. The other one is located in Montenegro in the Procletie uh, National Park and the Comovi Natural Park. And the third one, it's uh, actually where we are in the Samaria National Park and uh, Lef Kaori. Um, so as I said, I'm going to present to you the output of the working package tool, um, which assess basically the effectiveness of fire smart landscape management in reducing burn area, and therefore also the greenhouse gas emissions that are related with, uh, with burn, burn area. And this was a was a work that was uh, was uh, was done by NOAA, the National Observatory of Athens, and basically they calculated projections of burn areas and also linked with uh, then the greenhouse gas emissions under different climate uh, climate change scenarios. So uh, as I reported, uh, we have the worst uh, scenario from from the left. Um, the representative concentration pathway 8.5, which uh, is like the business as usual scenario, so no mitigation policy considered. Um, and then we go to the right, to the, to the let's say, um, the best scenario where actually um, there are some uh, ambitious mitigation policies are implemented. Um, we also consider um, 
not just the uh, climate change scenarios, but also, uh, uh, also fire smart landscape scenarios. So two uh, different scenarios, scenarios A, where basically uh, there's no uh, fire smart uh, measures intervention. And then the scenario B on the right, where actually uh, fire smart interventions are considered. So um, I'm not going to really deep into the statistical um, the statistical data, but I want to give you just uh, an overview because we're going to, uh, well, this modeling, this model, uh, it was meant to be used as a policy tool, so to influence actually uh, policy. And here, um, I just take the example from, since we are here from Crete, Crete from Western Crete. And um, as you can see here, uh, you have uh, on the left, um, the territory, uh, the analysis without consideration of fire smart landscape intervention. And as you can see, um, the projections for three different climate change scenarios and for the short term period, so from 2011 to 2040, um, the increase of burn area is actually uh, between 15 and 20 percent, while for a long term, um, a long, uh, a long time uh, period from 2040 to 2070, the percentage of increased uh, burn area is between 18 and 25 percent. This number changed. Uh, when we consider um, the implementation of fire smart uh, measures, interventions. So for example, if you apply 5% of these measures on, a, on the territory of Kanya, of, of Crete, we have actually lower percentage of increase. So for the short term period, we have an increase of burn area and therefore also of the related greenhouse gas emissions that are uh, between six and 10%, while for the long term, we have uh, an increase between nine and 15%. So um, as you can see, if we take into account fire smart landscape interventions, actually um, the increase of burn area, it's, uh, it's reduced and therefore also the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I will go through quickly just, uh, well, uh, it was yesterday that we, we said about the importance of showing maps. And uh, here we have the, um, uh, well, the Western part of Crete, there's the, um, there is the, um, uh, this is like a fire uh, spread risk map that was used, that was calculated by taking into account land use and land cover and uh, terrain, so aspect and slope. And um, the green, red, uh, the light, the light red area with low fire spread risk, while dark red areas are uh, high fire spread risk. And um, this is just to show you how we can practically use the model that Noah developed. So basically, um, what we did is uh, we create a buffer of fifty meters around infrastructures like roads or. Um, human infrastructures and a buffer of 25 meters on secondary path. And then we obtain by overlapping to the, to the map that I showed you previously, high fire uh, risk areas. So all these are areas that basically the fire, it's really, uh, there's a high risk of ignition. And um if we apply on this, so we applied on this the uh, the scenarios uh, of uh, fire smart intervention on two percent and five percent of the territory, and the outcome is that actually there's a predictable annual burn area overall reduction of three point two percent if we consider two percent scenario and seven point nine percent if we consider the five percent scenario. And as I said before, this is um, is not like really a, it's not a, the purpose of showing a model and a statistical tool, but it's actually more um, a mitigation tool that can support policies and can support countries in meeting, for example, the green the greenhouse gas emissions cut uh, by 2030. It can support countries in shifting from from fire suppression to fire prevention models. 
and then also enable um, uh, the countries to actually access financial mechanisms by showing that actually fire smart intervention can reduce burn areas in the future and therefore also greenhouse gas emissions. And I am almost finished. I will just want to highlight that uh, one of the important things of this project is actually to upscale the model to other regions, to the to the um, potentially to the old Mediterranean region. And therefore, we have um, disseminated the results and also the, the model by uh, ending a, a protocol um, to this network, this, which is called Met4Val. And Oikos, Institute Oikos is the secretariat of this, uh, this network of forest protected areas. So we wish uh, that uh, results and the model will be uh, implemented also in, this, uh, in these other forest protected areas. And to conclude, my recommendation are that when we think about climate change mitigation, as we thought, as we did in this project, it is important, of course, to work at bigger scales. So uh, we work at uh, regional scales, as we did for the, the Western Crete. Um, another one is that uh, the methodology and the, the approach must be easily applicable to other regions. So uh, it, be, it should be easy to upscale the results. And this means that the data that are required for the projections should be publicly uh, available. And despite the importance of public data, also it's important to have harmonization of the available data among countries. And for example, in our case, we had some problems with, um, there were some incurrences with Montenegro because it had um, uh, lower uh, resolution of data. And um, and the last one is just the importance, as I showed you before, of communication dissemination of their souls. So in order to have an impact, in order to um, have uh, implementation of their souls, we need uh, better communication and better dissemination also through uh, professional figures in the, in, the, in the organizations. And I'm going to conclude uh, here by thank you for the attention and also by just doing an announcement that there's going to be some um, material available at the table uh, outside. Then exactly the summary of the guidelines of forest uh, smart intervention, which was the output of the work package one. And here I also leave you the QR codes and the, and the, the website of the project where you can download the, uh, the protocol and the fact sheet of the working package that I just presented. Thank you very much. So, well, maybe we can start with a run of questions uh, for for the, the interventions of uh, table 2.1. Um, does anybody have a question? Yes. Uh, I have a question to Giuseppe, if he's around. Okay. Uh, it was very interesting, the... the uh, well, uh, two issues. One is the the, the fragmentation of the of the land uh, and the properties and the forest systems in the south, especially in some southern areas of uh, many countries, like our country, for example. And uh, is, the other thing is, is uh, significant is the approach of uh, urban uh, uh, silviculture. So the, my question is. Uh, uh, would it be possible for you to imagine that uh, rural communities and communities living around the cities would take in charge a portion of the forest in order to you know improve a sort of uh, um, making up of forest communities in a way and uh, restoring part of abandoned land from agriculture where agriculture is not more possible to be brought to head? Um, this is a very, very difficult question, uh, Teodoro. Um, what I can say is that there are examples in Europe, for instance, of cities that owns or that buy or that rent lands, forest lands, for instance, for different ecosystem services. So there are cities, uh, Vienna, for instance, is, uh, is one, but there are many others in which the uh, cities... Um, really manage, directly manage the forest in order to provide different type of ecosystem service. Could be water, but could be also other type of ecosystem services. So this is, I mean, 
a positive answer from from this point of view now if in if in the future this will increase i uh, i mean it is it is more difficult uh, for sure um what we are uh, i mean trying to do also as uh, efi in uh, i mean for instance the efi in efimed in the mediterranean region or us for biocities and so on is to promote uh, the idea of close interaction and links between regions, so bioregions and the cities, in order to provide also other types of, uh, of ecosystem services, like, for instance, wood. I mean, it could be really important to uh, plan the management of the forests all around the cities for different purposes, not only, I mean, for as I said, uh, uh, important ecosystem services, but also for material, for renewable material. Uh, of course, uh, there are two points that were raised uh, yesterday, and that's the economy part. That's very, very crucial from, from this point of view. And then also the land ownership. In, uh, in Italy, for instance, all the properties are very much fragmented. And so that's a, a, a very big issues but for instance there are also laws in order to favor the association of the owners or also private and public owners that that is also another important aspect that could have i mean uh, important implication for uh, for for the future but in any in any case working on the relationship between cities and the surrounding environments that will be crucial for uh, for the future thank you Thank you, uh, Giuseppe. Question is for you. Uh, excellent presentation. I would have uh, a question regarding the albedo because when you read, depending of the literature, it is really uh, very contradicting. And I think this is really an area that we need urgently a clear response. Uh, if the enlargement of forest, depending of the latitude, is more prioritary or not, uh, because what you say is very logical, but from albedo, especially we get exactly the opposite. And this is really in this uh, juncture, from a global perspective, not a Mediterranean perspective, really an issue that we have to, to get clarity as soon as possible from science. And uh, on the following uh, presentation, uh, I was a little bit uh, surprised when, when uh, pines were ignored as, as, as semi non autochthonous and only Quercus uh, ilex um, and, and, and olive from the following, not, not yours. Uh, and uh, I think we have to be a little bit cautious on it. There, there is huge areas in the north and in the south that are semi-arid in limestone, where Pinus alepensis is the single species that is able to survive. And therefore, the issue of species is about if there is clay, you can mix with olive tree, but without clay as well not. Uh, what is the right density in order to optimize the water yield uh, and to reduce the fire? fire? Uh, more than discussing about uh, the species, because that is in semi-arid in limestone uh, below 500 meters it's very difficult to have quercus ilex with very ex small exception so and also we have to speak about diversification many species due to grazing have been deselected sorbus domestica is an interesting species celtis uh, there are many broadleaves others that have been taken out by overuse or by grazing that could be reintroduced and diversify a lot and especially the broad the deciduous broadleaf burned less and uh, have also less uh, have better water behavior for the winter rain. Um, thank you, Eduardo. Of course, uh, the second question is is not for me, but it, it's very interesting too. Okay, so um, for for the albedo topic, I mean, this is really a crucial aspect. Just to, I mean, briefly uh, clarify this uh, this point. So. Um, the uh, I, I I started um, I mean trying to introduce the fact that in order to uh, anticipate or to uh, examine the role uh, of forests and trees from a climate regulation direct climate regulation point of view, we have to take into consideration the overall uh, energy budget. Energy budget means the light, the solar radiation that is coming. Uh, how much it is reflected, how much it is absorbed, and the evapotranspiration. How much it is reflected, of course, depends on albedo. Albedo, 
uh, can vary with forestries uh, because there are, I mean, Mediterranean forestries in general have a higher albedo we can just see from uh, Aleppo pine or other species. But it's also true that uh, forests could uh, reduce albedo compared to grasslands and so on. However, um, when I showed the data on climate regulation, they considered also the overall effect at night and during the day. So um, when uh, I showed the data on uh, the highest effect that is about one degree, one degree 0.5, these are in the best conditions. On the average, taking into consideration also albedo, but also amount of water is stored in the soil so that that can be evapotranspired, the uh, effect is still there, but of course is reduced. So on the average at the global scale, we are working on, we are working, we are using data that are uh, taken from satellite, of course, uh, more work should be should be conducted. But the data that, for instance, are using a joint research center really are global scale. And in any case, there is still, there is still a reduced, but still significant uh, effect of forest. Of course, this means that we should work also more precisely with species, different species could behave in a different way, and also management, because of course management can save water and so on. And then, okay, for I mean, for for the second speaker, I I leave the word to him. I want just to underline that, for instance, we work on pine, on a on a on a, on a pine species, Pinus laricio, a, a typical and endemic Mediterranean species. Thank you.